So before we get to our prophecy update, I want to take a moment and honor and pray for mothers on this Mother's Day. So here's what we want you to do, uh, moms, is have you stand, if you don't mind, stand up. We're going to have you share your testimony and your... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Stop. Come on, moms. This is our opportunity to thank you and honor you, bless you, and pray for you. I mean, literally, we couldn't have done it without you. (laughs) Literally, right? So God bless you, moms. (laughs) Can you remain standing? And we want to pray for you. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for moms. Thank you for the role that they play in our lives. Lord, we, for every single mother that is standing here in this church, and for those online as well, we want to thank you for them, but we also want to pray your blessing on them, especially in these last days, where the role of a parent, particularly that of a mother, is becoming increasingly more difficult. Lord, they need your wisdom, your strength, your power. So Lord, will you grant them that grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Again, thank you, moms. Happy Mother's Day. See? All right. Okay, let's get to the prophecy update. So today I want to talk with you about something that I've been inquiring of the Lord as of late and uh, also what He's been ministering to me in response. The question I've been asking about and inquiring the Lord concerning is whether or not there will be a final warning of sorts, whether it's on a national or even global scale, or are these warnings the only warnings that we're going to have before the Lord returns. In other words, is what we're seeing take place today the only warning that we're going to get before the Lord comes for His church? It's my belief that what we're seeing take place in the world today are warning signs like the warning lights that come on in the cars we drive. When that light comes on, it's to warn us. Uh, It warns us that time is of the essence and there's something that requires our immediate attention. So to Is this true with the warnings in the world today? The time is at hand, and those warnings warrant our immediate attention. Now, one need look no further than to the daily news feed to see that it's riddled with warning after warning of that which is coming. However, this presupposes that one is able to connect the prophetic dots, if you will, of what's happening in the world with what God warns will happen at the time of the end in His Word. I would argue 
that said dots are connecting faster than any of us can even begin to realize. I want to begin with this Al Arabiya report on Friday about the U.S. warning merchant ships of a possible Iranian attack in the Middle East. If you've been following this, and I think most of you probably have, uh, this is getting very serious. U.S. commercial ships, including oil tankers, sailing through key Middle East waterways could be targeted by Iran in one of the threats to U.S. interests posed by Tehran. The U.S. military said this week that a number of B-52 bombers would be part of additional forces being sent to the Middle East to counter what the Trump administration calls, quote, clear indications of threats from Iran to U.S. forces there. I think it would be a gross understatement to say that the tensions are escalating with each passing day. On Friday, the Times of Israel published a report about Secretary of State Mike Pompeo threatening a, quote, swift and decisive U.S. response to any attack by Iran in the latest of a series of escalating statements and actions. Uh, the rhetoric coming out of Iran is the United States would not dare to attack us. Oh, really? Them are fighting words, aren't they? You know, whenever I talk about escalating tensions, and certainly that's the case as we're talking about now, I always think of it this way. At some point, something or someone has to give. Would you agree? I mean, you just don't make these threats and then, okay, just kidding. I think of the, the schoolyard with the school bully. You know, at some point there's going to be an altercation. It's just a matter of time. It's not if, it's when and how soon and how bad. Pompeo was quoted as saying, our restraint, this is interesting, to this point should not be mistaken by Iran for a lack of resolve. The Times went on to quote President Trump, who said, this is very interesting. We have information that you don't want to know about. Kind of makes you want to know, know about it. When, <laughs> when somebody says something like that, it's kind of like, what do you mean I don't want to know about it? I want to know now, because you said it like that. Quoting the president, they were very threatening, and we have to have great security for this country and many other places. Now, when Trump was asked about the possibility of a military confrontation, listen to what he said, quote, I don't want to say no, but hopefully that won't happen. In other words, if I can say it this way, all bets are off. It's different this time. I can't tell you that decisively there's no threat or even possibility of a military confrontation. Uh, they're beefing up on their end. We must respond in kind on our end. Keep in mind, and maybe <laughs> we need to be reminded of what Iran chants, death to America and death to Israel. Death to America, we're the great Satan, by the way, and death to Israel, they're the little Satan. 
Well, make no mistake about it, Iran is not only responsible for the escalation in the region, they're also responsible by proxy for the recent Gaza escalation. As many of you, I'm sure, know, last week, in fact, it was last Sunday, some 600 plus rockets were fired into Israel from Gaza. Thankfully, they arrived at some sort of a ceasefire, which <laughs> the jury's still out on how long that will last. Of course, this is all timed in anticipation of the much awaited Trump peace plan, dubbed the deal of the century, which now we're told will be unveiled next month in June. There were some reports that parts of the plan had been leaked. And of course, speculation abounds. We cannot be sure. We're just going to have to wait and see. But this is all timed, I believe, in concert with that which we know will happen when Trump unveils that peace plan. Now, according to the Jerusalem Post, who quoted former National Security Advisor Yaakov, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Amador, who asks this question rhetorically, why did the Islamic Jihad do this, referencing the number of missiles that were shot and fired into Israel? The answer is again and again and again, Iran. Iran, through Palestinian Islamic Jihad, its proxy in Gaza, is behind the current escalation in the south. So Iran, responsible for the escalation in the south, so too is Iran responsible for what's happening in the north, in the Golan, with the border of Syria. Here's the bottom line. God's Word warns. That warning light is on. <laughs> Boy, is it. My wife has a bus up 2008 Honda Odyssey. I hate the warning lights on this van because they come on and, you know, they say you need an oil change. Okay, fine. You can push the button in it and it goes away for a little while. Then it comes back on again. You need an oil change. Okay, fine. Push the button again. Then it comes on and now it's flashing. You need an oil change. And then you go to push that button. It doesn't reset. And it just keeps flashing and flashing and flashing. And then finally you say, okay, fine. Okay, enough of my problems. Let's get back to the <laughs> prophecy update here. <laughs> this is what's happening. The, the warning lights are flashing. Warning, warning, warning. It's the time of the end. There's this escalation vis-a-vis -vis wars and threats of wars. And I told you this would happen. That warning light was there. And now it's on and now it's flashing. Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38, a couple weeks ago now, I think it might have been three weeks ago, we looked at the last three verses of Isaiah 17 and the last three verses of Ezekiel 38. And it becomes quite clear that they are both describing the same event. And that is this invasion of Israel. And already now we're seeing all of the players at the ready for this to be fulfilled. And so the warning lights are on. So at the beginning, I pose this question. Is there going to be 
one more final warning, maybe on a national scale, to wake people up. This is it. This is it. Or is this the only warning we're going to get? What do you think? I'm asking you. You don't have to answer, but maybe in your own heart before the Lord. What do you think about that? Well, wouldn't it stand to reason that whether there's a final warning or not, that we should take heed now? Because what if there's not? What if there's no more warnings? What if the Lord is saying, this is it, I already warned you. I already told you about Syria in Isaiah 17. I already told you about Russia, Iran, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, and all of these nations allying together. I already told you, I already warned you, and now the lights are flashing, and that's the only warning you're going to get. Would you agree that if that's the case, and it very well could be, that it would require our immediate attention? You'll forgive the bluntness with which I say this, but to ignore the warnings is to do so to one's own peril, whether you're a believer or not. What do you mean? I, I am a believer. How, how is ignoring the warning lights to my own peril? Oh, because if I'm not taking heed to the warnings that God has given me in His Word, then when that trumpet sounds, it will be for me as a thief in the night. It will catch me off guard, unaware. Oh, I didn't have my affairs in order. There were some people that I wanted to share the gospel with. There were some things that I wanted to do, some people I wanted to call. I'm saved, but I wasn't really expecting His return, because if I knew He was coming back this soon, I would have been ready. Let me, oh boy, here we go again. Let me hasten to say, I am not in any way implying that if you're a Christian born again of the Spirit of God, and you're not ready for the Lord's return, that you don't go up in the rapture. That's called, actually there's a teaching called the partial rapture theory that basically says only those that are on fire for the Lord, walking close to the Lord, ready for the Lord, watching for the Lord, only they will go up in the rapture. That is not grace, is it? That's works, isn't it? We're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. There's nothing we can do. So then all of a sudden now, I've got to earn the right to go up in the rapture. That's not grace. That's not grace. Now I have to confess that there have been times when you know, someone has really taken me to task on the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture, and argued that it's not before the seven-year tribulation, it's in the middle, or pre-wrath, or post. And I, I have to confess that I've thought, okay, if you want to wait until the middle of the tribulation to be raptured, then um, you know, so Lord, they, they're not waiting, uh, they're expecting it. So don't take them until the middle. Is that bad? <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? Okay, just pray for me because I guess the good thing is, well, on the way up, of course, we won't really have time, but 
we can tell all of our well-intentioned mid-trib and pre-wrath brothers and sisters on the way up, I told you so. <laughs> Is that bad too? That's bad too. So, okay, well, I'll repent. What I am saying though, is that it's those who are waiting and watching and ready with their bridal dress on and oil in their lamps, that when that trumpet sounds, oh my goodness, joy indescribable. What about the non-believer? Well, I think that's obvious. To ignore the warning lights of Bible prophecy for the non-believer can have eternal ramifications. This is why we do these weekly prophecy updates, and it's why we share the gospel very simply, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, the good news that Jesus was crucified, He was buried, and He rose again on the third day, and He's coming back again one day soon and very soon. That's the good news. That's the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. And now incumbent upon every single one of us is our response to the free gift paid for in full by Him that is offered to us. And that's why we do the ABCs of salvation. Now last week I shared about how that many pastors don't preach the Word and many Christians don't share their faith. And this could be the reason, I believe, for the decline of Christianity in the United States of America today. The disinterest is because Christians don't share their faith and pastors don't preach the Word or preach the gospel. So what I want to do in going over these ABCs of salvation is equip you, provide you with a tool that can sort of embolden you, because you never know who God might bring into your path this week to share the gospel with, and to have the, the privilege, and I mean that's an understatement, the privilege of actually leading somebody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's not to say that you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Then that's not to equip you this is how to be saved. Maybe for somebody online watching. It is childlike simple. It is ABC simple. The A is for acknowledge or admit that you're a sinner and that you need the Savior. This is basically what it means to repent in the sense that you're acknowledging your sin and you're turning to the Savior because of your sin and your need for salvation. Listen to what Romans 3.10 says. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death, but here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. By the way, parenthetically, let me say that we have these ABCs on the uh, bulletins that you have. You can tear them off and use them as a gospel tract to give to somebody. Here's the B. The B, quite simply, is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And as Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. That's the B. And here's the C. 
The C, again, very simply, is for call upon the name of the Lord, or as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, Romans 10, 13. For me, this was 37 years ago when I called upon the name of the Lord. And as Romans 10, 13 declares, all who call upon the name of the Lord will, will be saved. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough. It is impossible this side of glory to ever express to you the gratitude that we have, the joy that we have, the joy of our salvation, that we have been freely given. You paid for it in full. But we have been freely given this gift of eternal life, which means that we will spend all of eternity with you in glory, where there's no more death, there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow, no more suffering. Oh Lord, why would anyone delay the most important decision of their life for eternal life. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here in this amazing church that I'm so privileged to pastor, that has never called upon you, believing in their heart, confessing with their mouth, trusting in you, acknowledging before you their sin and their need for you. I pray that today they would surrender to you, accept you and this free gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.